the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. The Southern Kingdom was Judah and the Northern Kingdom was Israel or Ephraim and Ephraim went into captivity before in 723 BC. Judah went into captivity 677 BC. Um, Judah Ephraim did, did not recover in terms of the kingdom. Judah, while, while Samaria was, was replaced with persons, Judah was not. Jerusalem was left empty and the people could, 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 could go back. And so they went back to build the temple. And they were the harbinger of the, of the Redeemer. Christ would come through them. And so God kept them for that purpose. And they got time to repent and they didn't repent. So when after Christ came, they, 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 their rejection was sealed. They finally lost the, the, their, 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 their qualification as God's people giving the message. And the message was, was closed in the 34 when Stephen was stoned. The temple was destroyed in AD 70. And the... the God did not have a dynamic people again until 1844. I leave it there so somebody else can pick up and can. Amen. Any anybody else wanna wanna add on to that? Anybody? You also was talking about God, the way God's dealing with his people and the, um, the line of, of Jesus, where he come from, from um, Seth to Enoch, Methuselah, and so forth. I also realized in, um, in the book of Luke also, it, it started there, but it started backward like from Jesus go all the way back. So um if, if this is something um unique that I when I was reading it in the part in the book of Luke that if you see the way that um the lineage that Jesus came from these are people them that walk with God and no in our time, no matter how much we fall down from grace, he will pick us up back if we, if, and he knows our heart. He knows our heart and when we turn from all our wickedness and turn to him, he forgives you for all your sins. Amen, amen, amen. And anybody caught the part about what did the new denominated people would, would be like? What what would take place in 1844 and why that was significant? Anybody caught the significance of 1844 from our study last last night, especially? Um, the people in 1844 would be just like the people when when God denominated Israel, they had a prophet. They had the they, they had the, the commandments. They were taken out of Egypt, taken through the wilderness. They went to Canaan. They they had the, they had the temple. They had the, they had the, they had the commandments and they had the Sabbath. And they did on the people. Now they came out of the wilderness as well. They had a prophet. They had the Sabbath. They had the commandments. Amen. I'm not sure I have the order right but yeah some, yep. something is missing in what I said though no worries no worries anybody want to help out brother Davis <laughs> something feels missing um anybody want to wanna, something wanna, is missing uh, that, that one or two that's missing anybody uh, uh, sister Terry uh, oh, the, the, the 
connection is will not hear you. All right. Any any anybody else want to help out while that the, the audio there gets started? All right. So let me just talk about ancient Israel. Remember this: they they went into persecution. They were fine. They went into persecution in Egypt. They escaped persecution and went into the wilderness. Everybody see these three? Well, let me put it this way, three persecution escape wilderness they were then elevated into a covenant relationship with god they went through struggles they went through the jordan and then they went into the land of canaan when they got elevated at the time of their elevation they had a prophet the sanctuary message that's the one brother davis left out prophet sanctuary message they had the law and they had the, the Sabbath, which Sabbath. shone bright. The Sabbath shone brighter. In 1844, let's look at the history of what took place with the church. Of course, during the Dark Ages, the Christian church or the true, uh, the true church had to go into hiding into the wilderness because they were persecuted. And we can read that in Revelation chapter 12, which delineates that history. So the woman was persecuted by the devil went into escaped into the wilderness where she was nourished for time and times and a half a time from the face of the serpent and then coming out of 1844 the same promises that were made to ancient Israel and the same role that they were supposed to fill which they did not the people coming out the remnant church which would keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus in 1844, would take up back uh, the, the, this covenant relationship with God. Not as individuals. There will always be individuals. There has always been individuals. But no, we, there's a group. And that's the movement that came out of the wilderness and, and uh, got the prophet, who's Ellen White, we covered that maybe two or three weeks ago, they had the sanctuary because it's the understanding of the sanctuary that brought them to 1844. Number three, the law, because they were now in the most holy place and so the Ten Commandments uh, was, was just so much more enforced because during the Dark Ages, just like during the time in, in Egypt, they lost sight of maybe the importance of the law and so that, that was brought back forcible to their minds coming out of the wilderness because in the persecution, they couldn't, they couldn't keep the law as though they would want because when they were in Egypt, they were slaves and they didn't get day off to go worship on the Sabbath. So they couldn't keep the Sabbath in Egypt. Likewise, they couldn't worship God the way they would want to. And then over time, they kind of lost sight of some aspects and then in 1844, that came back. And then the Sabbath came back when, when they, they discovered the Sabbath truth. And uh, anybody remember who was the first one to discover the Sabbath truth? Back in, uh, not discover, rediscover the Sabbath truth after 1844. I know Joseph Bates was one that wrote about it early days. But um, there's another couple of people. It just, that, that part is slipping me right now. It was a lady. Um, it was, I think was one of them. It was Major a question something to do with it. Two, I mean, two voices. Yeah, I'm saying a, a lady. I'm Preston. trying to remember her name. Um, she got the message to Bates, and Bates um, developed some other um, um, teachings or understanding afterwards. I'm trying to remember her name. She was yeah. from the Seventh Day Baptist Church. Yes. I'm, like the name is just not coming. I know she gave the information to Bates and Bates dug into it and then he came back and presented it. But I know he was not, I know he was instrumental, but I know you got that from, from, um, from this lady. I just can't remember the name. He's not Preston. He's not no. Oaks Preston. No. Not she. I could be. The name is just, I it's so, he, you know, he feels far from me, so I can't, 
the name yeah. that there was a lady that went to church one Sunday and when she heard the Ten Commandments. There was a lady that went to church one Sunday and when she, when she heard the commandments read, she walked out of the church and didn't go back to church. I'm trying to. It's, it's, we, I, 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 as soon as I'm finished, I'll go check this part out. I know where to find it. And then I'll, I'll I'll give you that 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 little snippet of the history there. Just it's just not so fresh right now. But anyhow, so so they forgot. Then this the, the laws and the Sabbath truth came back, boom, full force. But let's let's go back to ancient Israel. What happened with them? After they were elevated, they had to go through the the the, the Jordan, and then they went over into the land of Canaan. Where is Can what is Canaan for us in the last days? Spiritual Israel, modern Israel. What is Canaan for us? United States. No, Canaan wouldn't be the United States. Canaan, you mean the New Jerusalem? Canaan would be New the Jerusalem. Canaan New Jerusalem would be Canaan for us, yeah. That's yes. right. Yes. Pastor has this song that he plays all the time. Uh, yeah. Language oh, of Canaan. Yes. Oh, that I yes, that's right. are in the language of Canaan. So that's the new, that's the, the land of Canaan for modern Israel. But before we get into the, the land of Canaan, you know what we have to do? Just like ancient Israel, we have the cross. The Jordan River. Everybody go to that? What does the Jordan River represent? Yes. What does the Jordan River represent for us? The Jordan River represents the sun. It always seems, seems eh? Would that be it? I want to hear some other 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 um kind of huh? Yeah, I want to I'm, I'm, I'm not answering you yet. I'm gonna answer, but not yet. Anybody else? What does the Jordan River represent? Baptism. No. Baptism. No. Right. Anybody else? Want to want to want to give a, a, another perspective on it? There's so many people on, but nobody talking to me. The way to freedom. The way to freedom. Interesting. I would agree with um, Brother Davis for the Sunday law, but I don't, don't ask me to explain. <laughs> I keep turning over the swelling of Jordan, but I'm not. All right. All right. Anybody? I know the Red Sea is baptism. Yes. Baptism is a Red Sea. That was yes, because they were baptized under Moses. This was before, way before right. the cross started. Before, right? Yeah. So, what does the Jordan represent, everybody? The swelling of the Jordan River. The swelling of Jordan is the persecution. It is the persecution, the time of trouble. The swelling of Jordan. So, before we enter into the land of Canaan, we just came out of the wilderness. Right now, we're out of the wilderness. And we're God's denominated people. We still have the journey to go into the land of Canaan. But before we can get into the land of Canaan, we have to cross the Jordan River. And the Jordan River, or the swelling of the Jordan, represents the time of trouble, such as never was. All who would live godly will have to suffer persecution. Have you ever heard that, that Bible verse before? Amen. So we need, we, 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 we it's hard to say, but we, we, we need it in order to make it. Because there are so many things in us that we have to fix. And uh, by God's grace, we, we, we will make it. By God's grace. We have work to do, every single one of us. Right? 
All right, so let's let's jump in. So I'm gonna go. So we we've covered that, and we know where, where the, the 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 25, 20, or the seven times leads us. So let's go back and see, um, you know, so that from, from a historical perspective, where it's coming from. All right. So let me just share my screen here. Could I have a reader, please? We shall be attacked on every point. We shall be tried to the utmost. We do not want to hold our faith simply because it was handed down to us by our fathers. Such a face will not stand the terrible test that is before us. We want to know why we are seven Adventists. What real reason we have for coming out from the world as a separate and distinct people? Amen. Those who are engaged in proclaiming hold the on, hold on, hold on, hold on. It says, for such a faith will not stand the terrible test that is before us. We have to know this. So in order for us to understand how we got to this point, we have to ask the questions. Why are we here? Just like Daniel. Daniel understood why they were in bondage in Babylon. We have to understand what, how we got there. What is the reason? Otherwise, we lose ourselves. We, are, we will be challenged. And we'll have to give up our beliefs if we cannot prove them. And so I put it to you, brethren, as we go through and we study, take the time to know, what, to, be, to know why you believe what you believe. Make notes, study, have this, because the Holy Spirit at the time is going to bring back to your remembrance, but you cannot bring back to your remembrance what was never there. Is that good? The Holy Spirit will bring back what was there. Cannot bring back what was never there. Yeah, man. So we have to Can't ensure wait. that we, we put something there. Can't wait joy if we never deposit. Amen. Amen. All right, Brother Davis. Those who are engaged in proclaiming the third angel's message are searching the scriptures upon the same plan that Father Miller adopted. In the little book entitled View of the Prophecies and Prophetic Chronology, Father Miller gives the following simple but intelligent and important rules of Bible study and interpretation. All right. And that's taken from Review and Herald, November 25th, 1884, in paragraph 23. So I, I just want us to keep this in mind. How are we supposed to be studying the scriptures or searching the scriptures? Proof text. You're supposed to be using the proof text method, the same method that William Miller used. Keep this in mind as we as we go through the remainder of our study. Because you're the gonna, method that Jesus used. The same method, line upon line. The same method, method that Jesus Isaiah used. recommended. Same method. Same the method. method. Um, sir. Yes. Can sir. I mention a story here? David Gates told the story, and I like it. David said that a, a Jesuit priest was somebody requested that a medical missionary help the Jesuit priest to reverse his cancer. And the, the, the medical missionary agreed on the grounds that he could have Bible study with his Jesuit, his Jesuit fellow. Okay, the Jesuit priest agreed to the offer. The medical missionary went to work and when the man began to get better, the, the, the medical missionary chipped in with his thing and said, okay, are you ready for the Bible study yet? The medical missionary said, yeah, the Jesuit priest said yes. An appointment was made and when the medical missionary went to begin his Bible study, he went to the man's house. The man said, before you begin, let's follow me. He led his way into his library. When he went, he saw all, all the spirit of prophecy books, all the Ellen White books. He said, but you have all, the, all our books, man. He said, yes, and we read them. He said, we believe that, it's, that Ellen White is the only true prophet of modern time. And that is why we don't want the Adventists to read these books. 
An interesting observation, though, and I'm going to ask a question along that observation. If you have, re if he has read all the books there, why didn't he apply the knowledge to get help get him to and apply the knowledge to help get himself better? Uh, you know that's a good question, but when you're reading something, to very good question. Thing, different from when you're reading it to learn the knowledge, to apply it. Amen. Thank so you. you're probably reading Thank it you. from a skeptical perspective, from a, a, a higher critical perspective. So he's not, he just, there are certain things that he couldn't shake. So he had to admit that, you know, this lady is solid, but he never really had the interest because it, here, here's the thing, Elder. And a part of it is trusting in God. Amen. But, but here's, here's the thing, Elder. He could identify and agree that she was a prophet, but had he bought fully into the message, he would be converted and maybe he didn't want to be converted. Exactly the point. <laughs> yes. Exactly where I was going next. Yes. That is it. That is the point. That's the point. Yes. If he bought into the message, he would be converted and he didn't want to be converted. It carries a price, the, 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 you know. And Virgin will carry a dear price for, for him. Yes. So he had in his heart then to lose his soul. Well, yeah. The, the it, thing is that Jesuits, yes. when, when they infiltrate organizations, they learn how to be a Catholic and learn how to be a Pentecostal and learn how to be a Baptist. So they go in the organization and, and learn how to be in order to do their research and to do their work. And that is, in, in, in research studies, that is one of the research methods. You go in and you dress like the people and you, and you live like them in order to research them. So in not, not, not only live like them to research them, but you live like them in order to change them and to disturb their prospects. Mm -hmm. They have taken an oath and it is not easy to dissolve themselves from the oath which they have taken. Yes. And a part of the oath which you have taken, they are not even to use their own mind to have their own understanding and to do as their conscience dictates. So all that has to be surrendered. And if they are going to change that any at all, their lives depends upon it. Yeah, it's de death. Death would be the price. But... So I, I, I could see that because when, when they really reason it out, if you really buy into what this, this, this prophet wrote, it would convert your soul. But, but anyhow, so we're going to move on. Remember, remember what we said. We said that um, the, may, the way that we should be studying is, is line upon line, precept upon precept, the proof text method that was, um, uh, what would I say now? Put Adapted. together by William Miller. Right. So he adapted from the Bible. He put it together and he wrote it out and we can trace all of it from, back to the Bible. So uh, do we need to do a, re a quick recap of William Miller or we did this recently and this is still fresh in everybody's mind? Let me know so I can just decide to move on or you still want us to read through just a couple of uh, paragraphs. Amen for me. You're, you're, it's fresh in your mind still. And I have the videos. Thank you much. Oh, wonderful. All right. Anybody else? Do we do we need to co cover this since we did it recently? You could. Repetition deepens impression. All right. Anybody else? Right. Like everybody drop asleep. Is everybody all right? Hello. Marvin, I drop asleep this time. Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> sister, sister but Debbie, shall learn, but I shall learn for me. It's good. It's good. All right. Yeah, it's fresh. Still fresh. Still fresh. All right. Yeah. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna just just probably touch. Sir. Yes. Yes, ma'am. What's the difference between? And I'm trying to to um share it with somebody. Con, there's found in con, context in me. What's the difference between context and concept? 
Okay, yeah. So so a concept is is kind of like something that you 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 try to visualize from a mental perspective. Whereas a context, and that's a very simplified answer, while a con context would be the the in the truest sense, I'm gonna give you two definition of context, right? So in the truest sense, the context deals with how something flows into each other, how it intertwines, how it interweaves. The way people use context now, they use it from an environmental or historical perspective. So when sometimes you hear the people speak and they say, oh, how, how would this system apply from in a Jamaican context? And so mm -hmm. it's more environmental or a historical uh, application of the word. But the original meaning of the word was how something flowed and how it entered. Mm -hmm. So there are two different ones. So that is why when we're reading something and you, get, you read a verse, you're saying, no, I, I, don't, I don't understand exactly what, what's going, play, going on here. So you know what we do? We start from the beginning of the chapter. We read a couple of verses above and a couple of verses below to see how everything flows into each other and to make, mm -hmm. sense, make sense of it. Because I'm trying to remember when I think it was Elder Sylvester who said don't like one of them the context or one of them. No, so here's what he's talking about. He's talking about the new definition of context, which, okay. which negates the old definition of context. Hmm. If, so if that makes sense. So the earliest definition was from like maybe 1851 and, and that original meaning was how something flowed. But the new meaning now in 2022 negates the original meaning and has taken on completely different meaning. Okay. So that is why he has a problem because he's saying the, or, the old, this old meaning is no longer there and everybody that uses the word context, they don't know what they're saying because the new definition is different from the original definition. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And so what the word context does know in, 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 in a theological circles is it lays the groundwork for higher criticism because it's talking about a historical context. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Thanks much. Uh, Thanks, Nathaniel. Appreciate. All right. Um, so let us let us go. Uh, uh, so let's just read this part here, just to just for our viewers that might view this afterwards. Um, could I have a read of a, just the highlighted portion here? Can I continue, or you want someone else? Oh, please, yes, please. Hello, there's a, this, a, a message in the chat. One second. Ah, oh, there you go. So it's the definition of a concept, a plan or intention. The sender has kept firmly to its original concept, or it's an idea or invention, right? So it's it's always something mental that that's you know conjured up in your mind a plan um, like that. And then we just spoke about con text, which is which is very different. Beautiful, thank you. All right, oh. all right. Um, God brother... sent his angel. God sent his angel to move upon the heart of a farmer who had not believed the Bible to lead him to search the prophecies. Angels of God repeatedly visited that the chosen one to guide his mind and open to his understanding prophecies which had never that which had ever been dark to God's people. The commencement of the chain of truth was given to him, and he was led on to search for link after link until he looked with wonder and admiration upon the word of God. All he right. saw that okay. there. Stop there. So, so a, a number of things. His mind was guided to prophecies that nobody understood before. Anybody remember why? No one understood these prophecies. You say this is fresh in your mind. Talk, you have to talk. Dark Ages issue, the, the whole hermeneutics thing coming from the coming from out of the Dark Ages with the, with, with the church and him, he turned out as a deist. So let's, let's, let's go back. If we read Daniel chapter 12. It was uh, shut up. 
it was shut up and shut up. until the time of the end. So nobody before 1798, the time of the end, could understand any of these prophecies. And okay. this Peter Miller was early in the 1800s. It was totally black, dark to everybody. They would read it and they just wouldn't have any light on it. It just be words on a page until after 18, uh, 1798, that's when William Miller was able to start understanding these things. So we could say then that the, the, the darkness, because the, the Bible did prophesy that there is going to be a famine of the word of God. And then we could say then that because of, because of the God seal of the prophecy to the time, he allows this darkness to take the world. And this darkness is the hermeneutics that have shaped Catholicism and Protestantism over the over the period. It's a big part of until, it. Until this time came when God was opening up his, his word, then he brought in a man like William Miller and opened his mind to the word of God in this type of a way. Amen. And he, we, the method that he used helped him big time, right? So let's right. look at, just read the highlighted portion here first, Brother Davis. All right. Angels of God repeated the... Oh, no, no, no. Here, right here. He was indeed rightly called Father Miller. Scroll up a bit, please. Come up a bit, please. It's hidden behind something here. Right. He was indeed rightly called Father Miller for he had a, a watchful care over those who came under his ministrations, was affectionate in his manner of, ge of genial and tender heart. So that's why it was called Father Miller for those people who say, the Bible said don't call, it was more of an affectionate term. Yes. Right? And not a spiritual or a religious term. Right? Um, not a proper term. Not a proper term. Thank you, right? Um, his right, approach, right. we have to, because he said we have to use the same approach, the same plan. So we have to approach it just the same. So how did William Miller approach these prophecies? It's the endeavoring to let a said all preconceived opinions and dispensing with commentaries, he compares scripture with scripture by, by the aid of a marginal references and the audience. Mm -hmm. When he found anything obscure, it was his custom to compare it with every other text which seemed to have any reference matter under consideration. That's right. So he, he never went to commentaries and went to listen to other people's opinions and he dispensed with his own preconceived ideas and he just allowed the scripture to speak to him line upon line precept upon precept if he's looking at the sabbath and he's reading something he doesn't understand he's going to read every other text in the bible that mentions the sabbath to make sense of what the sabbath means and that's how we should do it we should allow the, the, the bible to be its own expositor and take our own feelings out of it Right, but what the sense you see, you want to understand a topic, and you're going to find a book that somebody writes about the topic in the Bible instead of going straight to the Bible and researching all that the Bible has to say about the topic, which just makes sense. That seems like common sense, it's straight common sense. But, but you have to remember, Brother Davis, common sense is not common practice, it doesn't necessarily mean common practice. <laughs> Brother uh, uh, Sheldon, yes, sir. Just to put a little balance to it, you know, reading books that people have written about other subjects should not be dispensed with, you know. It is vital importance so that you can get the understanding as well. But to take if you if you take a book that a person has written and when you read the Bible this is something different, that means the Bible should take preeminence over that which the person has written. Because many of us will continue mm -hmm. to write books. We write books, we write tracts, and we invite issue them to people. We sell them, and we want people to buy them. So we can't just say that books are not necessary. They are, and they have a role, but they must not take, as I said before, preeminence over your individual study and research for yourself. Amen. Amen. Thank you Thanks for, for the that. correction, sir. Appreciate it. Thanks All for right. that correction. All right, so Brother Davis, I want you to read this one here. From, from, we're reading from Christ Triumphant, uh, page 337 and paragraph 3. Go ahead. Mark, section of the complete document. The entire thing. 
The mark section of the complete paragraph. The entire paragraph. Comparing his own expectations as to the effort of his preaching with the manner in which he had received by the religious world, William Miller said, it is true, but not wonderful, when we become acquainted with the state and corruption of the present age, that I have met with great opposition from the pulpit and professed religious press, and I have been instrumental through the preaching of the Advent doctrine of making quite manifest that not a few of our theological teachers are infidels in disguise. Mm -mm. That's a fantastic piece of talk. Yeah, what he says that he's, he, he made it quite manifest. You know why he made it manifest? Because by stirring up controversy, people put out their opinions and their views. And so he has made it, because of what he was doing, he's made it clear that a lot of these people are infidels in disguise. Because a lot of these, these people, once they go and learn higher criticism, they really don't believe the Bible. They really don't believe the Bible. So as we're looking at the seven times, let's look at how we got to the seven times, uh, what he was, you know, what his approach was. And uh, we're going to take this slow and, and, uh, and, and, and go through. So if I could have another reader, thank you, Brother Davis. If I could have another reader at this juncture, I would appreciate it. Okay, I'll read it seven times and how Miller discovered it. I yes. began at I began at Genesis and read on slowly. And when I came to a text that I could not understand, I searched through the Bible to find out what it meant. After I had gone through the Bible in this way, oh, how bright and glorious the truth appeared. I found what I had been preaching to you. I was satisfied that the seven times terminated in 1843. Then I came, then I came to the 2,300 days. They brought me to the same conclusion. Sister Lee, stop right there. No Thank you so much. Just hold on right there. So he says, yeah. I, I found what I have been preaching to you. What was he preaching at that time? I was satisfied that the, the seven times terminated in 1843. And he found the seven times earlier because that was in Leviticus. Then I came to the 2300 days, which is further around in the book of Daniel. And he said they brought me to the same conclusion. So the seven, both the seven times are, are the 2520 and the 2300 days share the same end point, the same conclusion, which was 1843. Of course, there was a mistake, as, as um, Sister White said, they were, God hid it. And so the actual date was 1844, but that was the mistake. Both of them terminated at the same point, and they eventually made that correction and move, moved on. So he found the, the, 20, the seven times before the 2300 days. So the 2520 was one of the first prophecies that he delineated, and then he got to the 2300 days. Everybody go to that? Yes. So let's let's read this one here, Sister Lee. Uh, from, a, from a farther study of the scriptures, I concluded that the seven times of Gentile supremacy must commence when the Jews ceased to be an independent nation at the captivity of Manasseh. When the best chronologicals assigned to BC 677, which the best chronologicals assigned to BC 677, that the 2,300 days commenced with the 70 weeks, which the best chronologers dated from BC 457, and that the 1335 days commencing with the taking away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination that make it desolate, Daniel 12, 11, were to be dated from the setting up of the papal supremacy after the taking away of pagan abominations 
and which, according to the best historians I could consult, should be dated from about AD 508, reckoning all these prophetic periods from the several dates assigned by the best chronologer for the events from which they should evidently be reckoned, all would terminate together about AD 1843. All right, so a number of things come out here. Um, the seven times, that's one prophecy. Mm -hmm. The 2300 days, that's another prophecy that you looked at. The 1335, that's a third one. Right. right? And, um, and all these, he said, would, would end together in about 1843. But I want you to pay attention. What did he call these? Prophetic periods. Prophetic periods in a plural sense. And so the, these prophecies were, were known as the prophetic periods. And when we talk about the prophetic periods, we're talking about more, more than one. And so it's, it's very important for us to pay attention to what Miller was saying here. Here's another one. Let's look at... Uh, one second. Let me just look at the Sister Lee, you're still, you're, you still require your service. Uh, let me just share my screen again. All right, so then let's look at some other uh, pioneers. First one we're looking at is James White and uh, what James White said. And we have to look at the year he said this too, because that's going to be important. Um, he, he said this in 1851. Go ahead. Our minds were directed to that point of time. 1843, from the fact that dating the several prophetic periods from those years in which the best chronologers assigned the full fulfillment of those events which were to mark their commencement, they all seemed to terminate that year. This was, however, only apparent. We date the seven times or 25, 20 years from the captivity of Manasseh, which is with great unanimity placed by chronologers to BC 677. So, so we see here, James- 1851. Yes. So mm -hmm. the prophetic periods, including the seven times or the mm -hmm. 2520, James White wrote about this in 1851. Are we seeing this? Yes. All right, let's see what Hiram Edson had to say about it. Edson's view differed with the dates that William Miller used for the 2520 prophecy. Rather than beginning the period in 677 BC with the captivity of Manasseh, um, Edson placed the beginning in 723 BC when the 10 Northern tribes of Israel were taken into captivity. 2,520 years from 723 BC ends 1798. These findings were published in the Advent Review and Sabbath Era. So this was 1856. 1856. Mm. So what, who saw what happened there? William Miller was looking at the captivity of Judah, while Hiram Edson was looking at the captivity of Israel. Remember, Israel. they were speaking two, and therefore there were two different lines of the 2520, which were both correct. Yes. Everybody see that? Yes. So they were just looking at two different lines of the 2520, just because Israel split in two. Mm -hmm. So one was focusing on Judah, one was focusing on, on Ephraim. And so... We see that these men believed these prophecies. Then there was a, a turn. Here's what, here, here was the major turn. This was J both James White and, and uh, I think Bates that did this study. Follow me. In 1851 and 1856, they believed it. But then we, after they did this review here in 1864, they didn't believe it anymore. 
they became the biggest objector or one of the objectors. Why? What does this say here? They went into? Linguistic review of German Bible. A linguistic review. And that, that was the, the source of problem for them. So, Sister Lee, if you could read this, it might be a little bit. Hola, Elda. Yes. As you touch this German Bible, remember that this German Bible was set up by the Jesuit institution. And uh, even though at this time it was not the Tubingen University, the Tubingen University nonetheless, afterward, before this time rather, had great influence upon the translation of the German Bible. So it again, all these are um, basically Jesuit, Jesuit um, products. Right. So these men gave away um, throughout their, their, one of their core doctrines because of the influence of Jesuits. And no, even now we hear people talking and say, oh, but they, they never believed it. And every single person that has an objection to the 2520 is using this article to substantiate it. But they just don't understand that this was a linguistic or a, or a higher critical review. How do we know that? Linguistic, it says, what does the red say here before we read the entire doc, the document? What does this say? And this... Go ahead, Brother Dennis. Sister Lee, I still want you to read it, but I want Dennis to read this one first. Go ahead, Brother Dennis. And this, and this position is fully sustained by the original, as brief criticism will show. The original what? The original language he's talking about, because it's a linguistic review. It's based on higher criticism. So when when did our people stop using? What 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 plan are we supposed to be using, people, to study the Bible? The plan that William Miller adopted. Next. Next. Method, line upon line. They, they threw out their belief because they went into linguistics and they went into not just linguistics, but higher criticism. Everybody follow that? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I looked at, um, I don't remember where I, I saw it. Where where um, Ellen White wrote about the first five, and then we mentioned it here, and I was sharing it with sharing it with somebody um the other day, and the person was like stunned to know that she wrote about it because when I was referring to it before while we we're doing the studies, it was like alien to the person, and people make up this and blah 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 yada yada. So I'm like, um, but if she wrote about it no i'm coming into this thing new and i'm trying to get my points lined up and i'm thinking then if she is this um this this main point in the church flow how come she, no other person didn't see i mean heads never saw this and he's ahead um this quote from her or was it deliberate in overlooking because she's the one who wrote it or she's the one who wrote it i, right. I can't I, I really can't say what they were thinking at the time but Good. what i would say because around this time in 1863 is when the church the seven day adventist organization as a legal entity was was put in place and what i read um was that at this point, these men, especially James White, who carried most of the burden, was under extreme stress. Okay. So I, I can't say if that played a part in, in, okay. in, in his oversight. I don't know. Or maybe it was just, you know, sometimes you, you, you get bored of using the proof text. Probably, I don't know. The men say that they, they, they here's what the men in, in the seminary say. Proof text too basic. They want something that's more scholarly. Okay, well, that could be the answer. I, I don't know. It could be. I don't know. Yeah, it sounds stern for it. it I don't know. Until, but until we get clarity, because when I look at it and I'm, I'm seeing, to read that William Miller and, and um, there, well, well, you hear people say, 
Ellen White found um, Adventism and, and um, with William Miller. But then the William bottom Miller part of it, would, you know, you know, William Miller was never a Seventh-day Adventist. I re, I, no, that's the thing that they would say, but the correction is to stand and listen to the correction now would take a longer time. Oh. So when I to this person now, is that the person was there longer than maybe you, and in the process of thing, when we ask, then it sounds strange to know that she wrote it, not that you would have read everything or all the books or all the writings and stuff. But when I look at it, it's like it's scared, it, it, it surprised you, the person, or scared them to know that I am saying this and it's not being said that because um, William Miller wrote it. It is something to ignore. But then she wrote it or, or under, under him, under him, she, was, she came out and to write what, what she wrote is like you're saying she got it from him. But no, to have her write it, it. and then, sir? She endorsed the yeah. method of study as the correct one. Right. So therefore, because he used it to get information of substance, and she wrote about it, it would sound like, oh, I didn't know that she wrote about it. I only heard of man writing this and that in that case. So when I read the first five for him, he was no... It's like the ears now stand up and he was now attentive. So he's like, okay, read the fourth one again with my ear. So it's like, I've never heard it before. So now that I'm knowing that she wrote it. All right, read the next one with me here. So I said, there are others, but she just made mention of it and made mention of about five. Just the first five. Yeah. Because the and first it sounded five interesting. Was, yeah. <laughs> they are the basics of proof text. And when you go from six honors, you go into prophecy, historicism. There you go. So it sounded interesting to him on that note to know that she wrote about it and it was not a here I'm scared I'm something. But it's not it's not what, what brother Elder Nelson I must say. We don't follow <laughs> the devised fables. Yeah. <laughs> Why am they with it? <laughs> I don't I don't hear. I don't Thanks, hear. sir. <laughs> I don't hear. All right. Sister Lee, please go ahead. Now, what is meant by not this? Not asleep. I'm listening, though. Huh? We never accuse you of being asleep, but thank you for the reassurance. Uh oh. Sister Lee. Now, what is meant by this repeated expression of seven times? We reply it denotes not the duration of the punishment, but its intensity and severity. It is well expressed in the language of verse 21. Thus, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. Sister Lee, could you stop right there? Yeah. One second. So it says, I bring seven times more. I remember when we dealt with this, we looked at the seven times more. I think in maybe the first time, the first lesson that we did, and we went to Daniel chapter 3 and verse 19 and showed that. Seven times more means intensity. Yes, but, but in verse 25 or 26 and then 28, it didn't have seven times more. It had seven times. So they're really being uh, deceptive in, in their, because this one does talk about intensity, but the others are not about intensity. The others are duration, but let's continue. The number seven denoting perfection. We are undoubtedly to understand by this expression the fullness of their punishment, that the measure of their national sins would in every case be fully equaled by the measure of their national calamities. National, national apostasy leads to national ruin, yes. Yes, and this is 1864. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And continue? Yes, please. And this position is fully sustained by the original as a brief criticism will show. So these men, so these men came up with they they they, they isolated verse 21. Mm -hmm. Isolated verse 21 
and says it, it denotes intensity and not severity and, and, and not duration. So it says not the duration, which is, which is correct for verse 21. And then they went into criticism to prove their original hypothesis. But they didn't touch the other two verses which dealt with the other one, which was the duration. And that's, that, that's the problem. And they went off into criticism to show that using the original language. And so it's just, this is a mess, first thing. They're using a Jesuit and, and uh, what do you call that? Uh, the the anti-Reformation Bible, the Jesuit okay. Bible, with the Jesuit method of study. Counter-Reformation Bibles. Right. That, that's, they're using the Counter-Reformation Bible with the Jesuit method of study to prove God's word to be a lie. Okay. Can we see that? Are you seeing what I'm seeing here? Yes. And then it's gonna then get it's gonna get even more interesting. No comment on the other verses, just that one. That's that one. They just pick out that one. Mm -hmm. But let's continue. In references to the Hebrew, we learn from the Hebrew concordance that the expression seven times in Leviticus 26 comes from Shevag. And this word is expressly set down by Genesius in those texts as an adverb. Also in Psalms 164, whatever that uh, proverb. Let's, 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 let's just stop here. Stop right there for a while. So it says it's expressly set down by Jesenius. Who's Jesenius? They're taking somebody else's. Um, writings and running with it to disprove what they already knew to be true in 1851 and 1856. See what we're talking about? Mm -hmm. Right. There's a yes, he was a he was a Greek scholar who uses the critical historical critical method a lot. So he was deep in um um the, the, the critical method um, um 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 observation and interestingly though at this point going forward as well a lot of the those persons who rejected the 2520 and others heavily right relied upon his commentaries mm -hmm. so if you if you run a search of references about him um through the 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 eg white app you'll be surprised the amount of persons who actually refer, referred to him so he was very he was highly rated however the fact remain that he uses the critical the historical critical method and was indeed both an hebrew and a greek critic he was a critic and so we have to take that with with um uh we have to be very very uh careful skeptical even as we approach these topics but i mean the, it will just go on and tell you so they, they'll tell you that um you know i, I just read some of this no if a period of time is meant by an expression seven times in leviticus 26 one of the wor these words should and would most surely have been used and the fact that neither of these words mean in link this is a linguistic study, it says that it's not a period of time, it's just intensity. The Greek is equally definite. The Septuagint, can you imagine? As in Leviticus 26, heptakis, which is an adverb. So they're going into Elder Nelson. Huh? Elder Nelson. I am here, I am here. What, what, what can you tell us about the Septuagint? You did this the other day. Ah, yeah, I dropped on my memory, I know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what can I say? Hold on, let me, let me just bring it up and read it. Hold on. All right, go ahead, go ahead, and then we'll, we'll come back to it. So what we're seeing is that using the, the 
the higher critical method and the studies from this gentleman, Jesenius, they rejected the 2520 as a time period. And then when you he when I hear people talk now, they say, oh, yeah, man, I know, Leviticus 26, no prophet, no prophet, no did it. I mean, say, how, 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 how can you prove that? They have no idea. They just heard somebody say it because they don't understand the Greek, the Hebrew or the Greek as well. And so they just come up with this uh, because they heard somebody say it. But it's based on a position of criticism. And it's sad to know that this is what, but then let's, let's go back while Elder Nelson is looking for this. Here's another thing now. In 1851, James White believed the 2520, right? Mm -hmm. In 1864, he rejected it. Yes? Mm -hmm. what, okay. did he write in, what did he write in 1875? 11 years later. What did he write 11 years later? Did he have a change of heart? Was he flip-flopping? What did he write in 1875? Read, could you read this for us, Sister Lee? We hold that the great movement upon the second advent question, which commenced with the writings and public lectures of William Miller, has been in its leading features in fulfillment of prophecy. Consistent with this view, we also hold that in the providence of God, Mr. Miller was raised up to do a specific work. Therefore, to us, the history of the important events in his Christian life and public labors possess peculiar interest. It is true that Mr. Miller and his associates and numerous friends were disappointed in the definite time of the second coming of Christ. And as might be expected from the nature of the case, those who had not sufficient interest to investigate the subject, especially those who are opposed to the doctrine of the soon coming of the Redeemer, conclude that the Second Advent movement has been a fanatical mistake. One second, one second it says, those who have not sufficient interest to investigate the subject. So when we hear people say, oh, it is so and so, you realize that they just, they, they reject it without really going to search stuff for themselves. Sometimes I, I'm talking to, I remember talking to a, a gentleman, good friend of mine. And I said, we're doing a, I was telling him about the prophecy school, the last one we did in Fort Moore, Jamaica. And, and, and I, he said, who's doing it? And I said, and I, and I told him who was. And he said, are those people, those people that believe in the 2520? And I said, yeah. And he said, what do you believe about 2520? He asked me, and I said, I, I believe it's true. I've studied it. It's solid. And I asked him, have you studied it? No, I have not. Most of these people have not looked into it. So, Ella. Go ahead. Yeah, the, the, the Septuagint is basically the Greek old testament which we know and understood to be corrupted when the the exchange of the the ministerial student in alexandria took place amen. so that is it in summary amen so so they were using a corrupt version of the bible not just the one that they got not just the jesuit one but they were using a corrupt one and that those are the two that they used to come up with the idea that the 2520 is wrong and then everybody else listens they have not done their research and they just run with it when the thing is plain as day sister lee could you continue first who plain is it funny from right here from where, but we right but we take a more favorable view of this matter we hold that Mr. Miller was correct in three of the four fundamental points of Adventism, while on the fourth, he was mistaken. But even this one mistake, viewed in the light of scripture and reason, does not in the least affect his general position. Hold on, so is he saying now that Miller was right all along? He made a one, a one mistake, but that doesn't affect anything. Everything else that he covered was solid. Is that what he just said? 
Yes. What is the one mistake? The 1843? No, that the earth is the sanctuary. No, the one mistake was that the earth is the sanctuary. Oh, the earth is the sanctuary. Ooh, okay. yeah, trade controversy, page 409, um, paragraph 2. So that means that he is now agreeing with the 2520. Yes. What, there was only one mistake he said, and it's that the earth is a sanctuary. And he's laying out the four points now. So let's read the four points that he said Miller was correct on. Okay. One. Mr. Mr. Miller was correct in his views of the pre-millennial second appearing of Christ. No doctrine is more plainly stated and more fully sustained by the sacred scriptures than the personal appearing and reign of Jesus Christ. And whatever may be said of the view and the labors of Mr. Miller, this fact will not be denied that very many ministers of the different denominations changed their views upon the millennium, renouncing the popular view of the conversion of the world. conversion of the world and the spiritual coming and reign of Jesus Christ. Two, Mr. Miller was correct in his application of the prophetic symbols of Daniel and John. In this, he is sustained by Protestant expositors generally. Number three, he was also correct in his exposition and application of the prophetic periods. The date fixed upon, the dates fixed upon have stood the test of the most rigid criticism. And those Adventists who have changed to other dates have done so simply because of the passing by of the first periods of expectation. So one second, Sister Lee, what do you say? He was also correct in his exposition of the Prophetic periods. All right, so let's go back to what, 20. Yeah, what, what did William Miller say? The re all reckoning all these prophetic periods, prophetic periods. seven mm -hmm. times, 2300 days, the 1335. So all these represent the prophetic periods that William Miller was talking about. Mm -hmm. So then White comes down here now and says that Miller was correct in his exposition of all the prophetic periods. Ella. Yes, sir. No, man. Me and all the prophetic periods save in the 2520. <laughs> what the document doesn't say that without... It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. It doesn't that say that. No. It's left out of the sentence. It doesn't say that. I'm just parroting them. That's not my view. Please. <laughs> the document doesn't say that. Mm -hmm. Right. So number four and final. All right. Number four. But Mr. Miller was mistaken in the event to occur at the close of the prophetic periods. Hence his disappointment. In the case of the 2300 days of Daniel 8, which period was the main pillar in his calculations, his error was in supposing the earth to be the sanctuary of that prophecy and that it was to be cleansed by the fires of the last day. What was the mistake? That was the mistake. This was the mistake that the earth was the sanctuary. That was the only thing he was wrong on. He was correct in everything else. James White came back in 1875 and said this. So let's go. In 1851, what did he say? He said the prophetic periods, including the 2520, would terminate in 1843, which we know that date was corrected, right? To 1844. Mm -hmm. So he believed the 2520 this time. By the time he went into linguistics, mm -hmm. By the time he went into linguistics, what happens? He discarded the 2520 because of his linguistic uh, approach. The critics, higher criticism forced him to discard it. And then now 
1875, he had a change of heart, supposedly, and went back to say that Miller was correct in everything, except, in everything except. that he said Ur was the Mr. son. Is that, is that very, very clear? Yes. So we see that this thing is unshakable. But I, I have brethren and I know people that, that are, are seeking to shoot it down. Simply because the, the people that they listen to are higher critics. At higher critics they use higher criticism and therefore they cannot appreciate the simplicity of the gospel right um of course i'm, I'm finished now i just want to share this with you are you seeing my screen here yes so these are the charts and the 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 seven times or the 25 20 Especially is on this chart. It's, I don't know if you can even see anything because they're not that clear to me. Right? But I have them here. Everybody needs your charts. Can you see? Are you seeing it? Yes, sir. Everybody needs your... I have a bunch of charts here too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, can I get? Yes, yes ma'am. No worries. So no worries, you, the laminated one. Uh, send it to brother, send it to Elder Marvin. You hear? He probably has some too. So are you seeing on this chart here? This is the first chart, the 2520. Yes, sir. Right. And it's there again down there. Right. And so I am mostly hearing the 2300 days prophecy being pressed or stressed and there's than I, the I have no issues with that my issue is just that when they say that it, 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 it's not true okay i have no issues with that and then here is the second the second chart which was this was the 1850 chart it's a 677 677 again on it are you seeing that you see the seven times right here are you yes, not sir? Are you not seeing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it, it gives the explanation and it has the calculation. Where is it? I know it has it. So the explanation of the times. It has it down here in the bottom. This would be the bottom. Oh, oh right. The right hand corner. So it says the explanation of the times. And some people come up with some explanations. Oh, so in the first chart, the 2520 was big. But in this one, the 2520 is only at the bottom. But the 2300 days is at the bottom too. So does that mean it, it's thrown out too? Are you seeing it? 2520 and the 2300, 2520 is here, 2300 down here. Yeah, so you need to have these charts. The commas up here. 1843, 1853. Two charts. You need them. All right. And we can do another study on the charts. Um, I think Elder, I think Elder um Sylvester had done the charts some while back as well. Nelson. No, it's Nelson. No, Sylvester. Really? Has I Sasha I read for him? Sasha. Oh, okay. That's good. That's good. Yeah. I remember this, this doing Sasha I read for him. I don't remember what the topic of the study was, but I know he went through them and had me to take because I have my two. Okay, then. I wasn't okay. here during that time. Uh, but sir, yes, sir. When you look at it, if you go to Daniel A13, the conversation between Jesus Christ and Gabriel 
was about the 25, 20, and the 2300. Both of them? Yes. Gabriel mm -hmm. asked Christ about the 25, 20, and Christ used the 23 only to answer him. Mm -hmm. So you cannot get away from 25, 20. It is all over the Bible. Oh, you, you How long shall be the complete vision? That is the question. How long is the vision is going, is going to continue? About the daily mm -hmm. of desolation, which is the daily, which is paganism from, seven, from 723. And the transgression of desolation, which started in, 80, in 1798, at the end of the, the first 12, 16 years. And Jesus turned and started 2020 days, then the desolation to be cleansed. And when, 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 when he, he told Gabriel to, to speak to Daniel, he told Daniel, I will make you know what is the last end of the indignation, and the indignation of the 2520. So I cannot understand why persons have, in departing from the word of God, is condemning this, this prophecy to non-existence. Mm -hmm. All because we want the sin problem to continue. And we don't want to, to tell people that Sin is, is causing destruction. Sin is causing everything is everything is happening to us, and we need to get out of sin in order to be ready for the coming of Christ. Amen. I'm gonna just cover a, a few. Yeah, just answer your own question, brother Davis. Hey, one second. Let me just. Where can these charts be found? The Book of Habakkuk talks about these charts. Um, just this, is just for people that are. Um, maybe watching on YouTube eventually. Uh, um, Brother Sheldon, we are about two minutes away from close of Sabbath. Yes, I, I just I just want to touch a couple of things. Um, I'm not going to take a couple long. So in the book Evangelism, Sister White writes about these charts. Um, the use of charts. So she writes about charts. She writes about the, the 1843 charts. Uh, and the the... James White wrote about this as the original faith, right? And I want to just read one. This is the quote. A book, a, a book, a how much elder? The book of a, two. You can read one to four, right? But I want to read this one here from the pen of inspiration. It says the chart, a chronological chart of the visions of Daniel and John calculated to illustrate clearly the present truth. So the, the charts are to bring up about the present truth. Those who teach present truth will be greatly aided by the chart, which is the 1850 chart, because this was 1850. Not current affairs, not current affairs. No, this is present truth. The charts represent present truth. This is present truth. When I even talk about, this is present truth. The charts are present truth. For God's people, and she was specifically talking about the 1850 chart. The 2520 was on the 1850 chart. That's present truth, people. And so I have a lot of other ones. Come, brother Gordon. Brother Gordon, you said 2520 was on it. It is on it. It is still on because it it's, on it. it's on both charts. It so was on it. It is on it. It is still present truth. This is from the pen of inspiration. And so it's it's sad where we found, where, where we have found ourselves. Really sad. But anyhow, um, I'm gonna close off here with her. Let us pray. Almighty God, we are so grateful and thankful for your blessings in our lives. And as we have gone through your word, we, are, we ask that you'd help us not to forget as we have seen the danger in forgetting Lord and that's how you have told us to remember. We ask that you forgive us of our sins and help us to be your useful mouthpieces in this world and to use us to carry out your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, everybody. So I'm going to turn over. I think Sister Terry is still here. And uh, that's it. I, I'm, I'm wrapped up. Present truth. Just remember. Yes, Present brother truth. Davis. Brad Davis? Yes, 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 yes. Can you do us the honor of um, closing off, taking the prayer request and whatever? Okay. 
Is there any new prior request, please, brethren? Good evening. So the blessing for the day. I say good evening. The blessing for the day, the Lord has been with us all through the day. Good evening. Early morning session, and then we went to the international convention. And I know we were blessed. We have come back and so end this Sabbath with this great blessing of discussing God's word. Do we have any additional prayer requests, please? I have Mr. Samuel Dunkley. The name I wanted to remember from last week, from, from earlier this week. Samuel Dunkley, somebody I'm giving assistance and studying with, along with um, Noel Nemhar. And Nemar's sister is um, Nadia Edmond. Is there someone to add these um, to the list, please? Nadia Edmond, Noel Nemar, and Samuel Dunkley. Is there anybody else who, who, who has who, who has names to add to the prayer list, please? Anyone? Yes, okay, good evening, yeah. brother. Wade, yes, brother Zenas. Brother Wade Enville and his family. Wade. E N V I L. E N V I L. E N V I L. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, Jermaine Thompson. Jermaine, that is G E R. J J J E R. Jermaine. Nadia. Edmund. Noel. Nem Hard. Yes. Anyone else? Clinton Grant, C L E N T O N. C L E N T O N Grant. Grant. Okay. 